Today we will be running through the practice quiz for thermochemistry. Uh, for our first question here, we're looking for the units that could be used to represent temperature in the equation Q equals mc delta t. Now right off the bat, looking at joules, I should know that that one cannot be used because it's not a unit of temperature. Uh, joules could potentially be used for Q, but not for delta t. Out of our remaining temperatures, Kelvin was used in our gas law unit. We haven't used that at all here. Uh, and Kelvin would not cancel out with our uh, specific heat capacity. So our value of C is typically in units of joules per gram degree Celsius, which means that we're also eliminating Fahrenheit here. Celsius would be the correct answer. That is the temperature unit that we've been using throughout this entire unit. All right, for our next question, which of the following units could be used to represent heat in the equation Q equals mc delta T? Well, first you have to recognize which of the units is heat, and that would be Q. Now, out of our options here, we know degree Celsius is definitely wrong because that is a unit of temperature, so I can eliminate that. Now, all of the re uh, remaining units here could potentially be used for heat, but we do know that with specific heat capacity, we know that that is in joules per gram degree Celsius, or it could also potentially be in calories per gram degree Celsius. So that eliminates kilojoules. So while you could have kilojoules as a unit for heat, using this equation, you would have either joules or calories. Now, on your quiz, when you're actually plugging in the numbers, I will have everything in units of joules since that's what we've practiced. But calories is another acceptable unit that could be plugged in there. So I just wanted to make sure that you knew that both of those units are good for what you would have for heat. All right, so here we have 25,000 joules, and we want to know how many kilojoules this is. Uh, there's two ways that you could go about doing this. You could set it up as a metric conversion, like what we did earlier in the year. So I have 25,000 joules. Using dimensional analysis, I can see that joules would cancel on the bottom, kilojoules on top, and then I just have to remember the equivalency. So for one kilojoule, you have 10 to the third joules or a thousand. So basically you're just dividing by a thousand here, which would leave you with 25 kilojoules. Now alternatively, you could also just remember that as you're going from joules to kilojoules, you're dividing by a thousand. You do have to show me all of your work on your quiz, but I don't necessarily need to see the work for this part. Uh, just make sure that you're filling in all of your work for Q equals MC delta T and those types of equations. All right, for number four, this is very similar, but now we're actually going backwards. So again, if you wanted to set this up as a conversion, let's say that you don't remember if you're supposed to multiply or divide, you know that kilojoules goes on the bottom to cancel, joules on top, and then since kilojoules is larger, that gets the one, and there are a thousand joules within the one kilojoule. So here we're multiplying by a thousand to get 16,000 joules, which is the final choice here. When energy is transferred from the system to the surroundings, this could be described as a blank process. This would be exothermic. So in our notes, we had those uh, pictures with the boxes where you can kind of see if the energy was going in or out. If the energy is going out of your system, which is represented by this box here, that's an exothermic process. So you're going from the system to the surroundings. If it is going from the surroundings into the system, that would be an endothermic process. Remember, endo means within. When blacksmiths, uh, blacksmiths are working with metals at extremely high temperatures, they plunge the metal into water to cool it down quickly. Which of the following explains water's ability to absorb a large quantity of energy before its temperature increases? This would be specific heat capacity. Surface tension we haven't talked about at all. Uh, hydrogen bonding we have, but that was in a previous unit. It doesn't have anything to do with what's happening here. Uh, density should have no effect, and the polar bonds is kind of similar to what we we're talking about with hydrogen bonding. So remember, specific heat capacity is basically how good something is at absorbing energy before the temperature goes up. Metals have very low specific heat capacities. That means that Heat passes through them very easily, it makes the temperature rise very rapidly, it also cools down rapidly. 
uh, whereas water it's a little more stable. You have to put a lot of energy in into it to make the temperature go up. Uh, you also it takes a long time for the energy to dissipate. Seven. Which of the following processes can be analyzed using thermochemistry? Energy transfer as a warm object comes into contact with a cooler object. That is correct. So we can have that one. Uh, that would be like one of our pictures where we showed the uh, energy eventually being transferred from the warmer, warmer object to the cooler object, and then they reach what we call equilibrium, where they're both at the same temperature. So also basically what happens in our calorimetry lab when we had the specific key of aluminum, eventually the aluminum and the water reach the same temperature. Uh, energy transfer within a chemical reaction, we could definitely analyze that. Uh, energy transfer within a phase change, same there as well. The form that energy takes as it is transferred. So we have that diagram within our notes with all the different types of energy. Uh, I gave the example with the light bulb. So you run electricity into the light bulb. That energy is then converted into other forms. So the energy is coming off in the form of light and heat. Uh, energy transfer during the process of dissolving a solid in a liquid like water. Uh, that is also something that could be analyzed inside of a calorimetry, uh, calorimeter. So for this one, all of the answers are correct for number seven. Number eight. Which of the following symbols is delta H equivalent to at constant pressure? This would be Q. This was just a fact that you should know from the notes. They're called constant pressure calorimeters. So in order for a calorimeter to do what we need it to do, you assume that you have constant pressure and then the symbol will be Q. All right, nine. During our specific key of aluminum lab, we assume that Q metal was equal to the negative Q water. So they are equal in value but opposite in sign. Which of the following laws or principles allows us to make this assumption? That would be the law of conservation of energy. We know that energy cannot be created or destroyed. Uh, it can be transferred from one object to another. So within our calorimeter, we had our water. You had the aluminum sinker, which is somewhere underneath the water. So it had to be completely submerged. So as the metal is losing heat, is being transferred to the water, and because this is an insulated cup with a cap, we assume that energy is not able to leave this area, so it is going from the system of the metal to the surroundings, which in this instance is the water. Number 10. Which of the following would most likely be a source of error in the specific heat of aluminum lab? Uh, the bigger source of error was the amount of time that it took to transfer the aluminum to the uh, from the beaker to the calorimeter, and most of you got this the first time. Uh, we know that the metal is going to uh, gain heat and lose heat very rapidly because of its low specific heat capacity. Uh, as you are passing it through the air, the air is much cooler than the metal, so you're losing energy to that. So the longer you have your metal within the air before it's transferred to the water, the more heat is lost, which is not going to go into your calculation. All right, now we're gonna start getting into some of our calculations. But uh, first, this is just a concept question here. We're actually given our delta H already, so you don't have to calculate it. Uh, we're just asked if it belongs on the right side of the thermochemical equation. So if delta H is positive, that means that it is endothermic. It means that energy is going into the reaction. That sounds like it should be on the left side of the equation. So this would be false. The way that you would write out this equation correctly, if you wanted to have it on either side of the arrow, you write carbon solid plus 2 sulfur solid plus 89.3 kilojoules yields carbon disulfide liquid. Uh, now, if this was a negative sign, let's say it was negative 89.3 then you would put it on the right side of the equation so that it would look like this so this is for when your delta h is negative this is for when delta h is positive 
So since our delta H was positive here, this is the correct one. And this would be wrong. All right, how much heat is released when 15.6 grams of iron reacts? And we have a balanced equation here. Uh, this is one of the thermochemical stoichiometry problems that we did. And on your quiz, you'll see two questions similar to this. So when you're given one of these types of problems where they give you the mass of one of these substances and they give you the balanced equation and you're supposed to convert, you write down the one number that they give, gave you with the unit and the element or compound. Now if I'm going from grams to heat, which is my kilojoules, which I see here, I'm going to need two steps. Within my first step, I can cancel out the unit from before, so grams of iron on my way to moles of iron. Then I can cancel out moles of iron back out to kilojoules. When I'm comparing moles and grams, moles is 1, and grams is from the periodic table. So 55.85. When you're comparing moles to kilojoules, the moles is from the balanced equation. It looks like we have three iron here. And the kilojoules is from the equation up here, so our delta H value. Notice that I did not carry the negative sign down. It does say how much heat is released here. This is the same as the practice assignment the first time around. It's kind of redundant to have a negative released. So we're going to leave it as a positive. All right, from here you multiply and divide across. You have three significant figures that you're starting with. So your final answer should be 104 kilojoules. All right, so this is the same type of problem. It's still a thermochemical stoichiometry problem, but this time we're starting with our kilojoules and we're trying to get to grams. So we're still doing that two-step conversion, kilojoules to moles, and now moles back out to grams. And this is all for iron. I didn't write that in before, but you really should write this in so that you know which values you're supposed to plug in. So when we're comparing moles and grams, moles is 1, grams is 55.85 from the periodic table. Uh, when we're comparing moles and kilojoules, it's from the balanced equation, so I have 3 moles of iron, 1120.48. So I use the same exact equation as before, we're just plugging it into a different order, we're obviously starting with a different number, so we're going to have a different answer. Alright, for this one, when you multiply and divide across, you should end up with 370 grams. And this is two significant figures, since our starting number here was two significant figures. All right, our next problem here is similar to the ones from our specific heat uh, worksheet that we had. So we're looking for a specific heat capacity of a metal. Uh, this one we're going to be using Q is equal to MC delta T. And in these specific heat problems, there's no flipping of signs or anything like that. So all the numbers that are given here, they belong together. They'll all plug into this equation. So let's pull everything out and see what we have. So for our Q value, they give us 505 joules, 500.5 uh, joules. Our mass is 25.0 grams. The specific heat is unknown, that's what we're trying to solve. Our delta T says increased by 52. So they already did the subtraction part for us. They're saying it's 52.0 degrees Celsius. Once I've done all this, I have to rearrange, rearrange these letters and solve for a new version of the equation. So from Q equals MC delta T, I should divide both sides by M and delta T. The masses and temperatures cancel on that side. So I have C is equal to Q over M delta T. So I'm going to plug in my numbers. I have 500.5 joules divided by a mass of 25.0 grams and a temperature change of 52.0 degrees Celsius. 
I have uh, four, three, or three sig figs. So I'm going to round my final answer here to three. And that is joules per gram degree Celsius. None of these units cancel. All of them are present in my final answer. All right, so for this question, we're referring back to the previous question. Uh, we found that the specific heat was 0 0.385 joules per gram degree Celsius. That's true, false, so just uh, confirming that it is copper. Now, from what's given to you here within this assignment, you wouldn't necessarily know that. So what you would have to do is look up the specific heat capacity of copper. This is similar to something that we saw in our lab. And then you would have to see if it is the same number. Uh, for this one, this is true. Now, what this could potentially look like on your quiz, uh, I would give you a data table of some kind. And if you were asked to confirm or maybe identify something, you could simply look at that table and then see if the numbers match up. All right, so we're going to go through uh, one more of these specific heat capacity problems. So for number 16, still using the equation Q is equal to MC delta T. And I'm going to pull everything out of my word equation. The Q here is negative 28,000 joules. The mass is 150 grams. And the temperature change is negative 425.0 degrees Celsius. Now here they gave you the two values. Make sure that you're doing TF minus TI because if you do it the other way around you're gonna end up with the wrong sign and I need these two negatives to eventually cancel out so that specific heat will be positive just like before I have my equation which I'm gonna move the letters around for so I'm gonna divide by M and Delta T again because I want C so C is equal to Q over M Delta T the Q is negative 28,000 the mass is 150 grams, and the temperature change is negative 425.0 degrees Celsius. When you plug all this in, you should get 0 0.44 joules per gram degree Celsius. This time I only use two significant figures in my final answer because I have two significant figures here. So our value for C this time was 0 0.44 joules per gram degree Celsius. This time, this is going to be false. If you look up the specific heat capacity of silver, it's 0 0.24 joules per gram degree Celsius. So this is clearly a different metal. All right, for number 18, this is a calorimetry type problem. So this would be similar to the ones that you saw in the calorimetry practice, which was on Kia. Uh, these are the ones where we do Q equals MC delta T. And then we flip the sign. And then we find the moles of our solid. So we're going to have our two separate problems, which we eventually bring together in the end. So all of this stuff initially is going to be of water. So Q of water, mass of water, specific heat, and temperature change of water. So let's start pulling that stuff out of the word equation. The Q of the water, I'm going to have to eventually solve for. So that's unknown. The mass of the water is 80.0 grams. So remember, they will give you two masses in this type of problem. You have to make sure you use the right one. Because I'm going to be using all the water numbers here, it has to match up with water. The specific heat of water is not given in this problem. At this point, you probably remember what it is. It's 4.18 or 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. Uh, this will be present in a data table on your quiz. Then we have the temperature change of the water. It says that we're going uh, from 31 to 21.6. We have to do final minus initial. So it's going to be negative 9.4 degrees Celsius. So the first thing I'm going to do is plug everything in for Q of the water. So I have 80.0 grams times 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius and negative 
9.4 degrees Celsius. <clears throat> uh, QW is going to be equal to negative 31,000, sorry, uh, 3,100 joules. And then if I wanted to put that into kilojoules, it would be negative 3.1 kilojoules. So I just divided by 1,000 here. Now, the last part of this that I need to do is flip the sign. So remember, this is related to law of conservation of energy. So if I have 3.1 kilojoules being released, because there's a negative sign here, so that much given off by the water, that means that the system, or in this case, the solid being dissolved in the water, must absorb the same amount of energy. All right, we're going to hold on to this number for the end. We don't need it yet. Now we're going to use that 15.6 that they gave us. So this is the part that's like a one-step stoichiometry problem. I'm going to cancel out my grams of KCl on my way to moles of KCl. So in one mole of KCl, you add up the molar masses at 74.55. You end up with 0 0.209 moles. So we have this many kilojoules for 0.209 moles. So by dividing these two answers, I have 3.1 kilojoules divided by 0 0.209 moles, I can get my answer in kilojoules per mole. So I'm rounding for two significant figures here. It comes out to 15 kilojoules per mole. So this will be my final answer. And when you type it into key, you can type it with or without the positive sign for the 15. All right, the next question is very similar. So this is also a calorimetry practice type. We're going to be doing the same thing. So QW equals MWCW delta TW. So we're doing Q equals MC delta T for all the water stuff. The QW is initially unknown for these types of problems. The mass of the water should be given to you. So that was the 80 grams here. So the same mass from before. Specific heat of water has not changed. That's a constant. Now I believe in the answer key for this one I used the 4.18, not the 4.184. But I did double check it. It shouldn't matter which one you use. You should get the same answer either way. And uh, delta T for this one should be 3.9 degrees Celsius. So again, final minus initial. So you can see here, we're going to have a positive sign this time. All right, so I'm going to plug everything in. QW is equal to my 80 grams from the water times the specific heat times the temperature change of 3.9 degrees Celsius. QW is equal to 1,300 joules. And if you're getting something different on your calculator, I'm just, I'm rounding here because there's two significant figures. So that's the only two that I'm allowed to use. Uh, I could also say that this is 1.3 kilojoules. It doesn't matter if you convert here or if you convert when it's Q of system. Either way, you'll get the same thing. Now remember, this means that the water absorbed 1.3 kilojoules, which means that the system has to give off 1.3 kilojoules in order to uphold conservation of energy. So we're going to hold on to that number for the end. Now I have my 25.7 grams of sodium iodide. I'm going to cancel out grams to moles. I look up the mass on the periodic table. That is 149.89. Comes out to 0 0.171 moles. So I'm going to take these two numbers and bring them together. So I have negative 1.3 kilojoules. And that's how much energy is released when I react 0 0.171 moles. So if I divide these two, I'll get my answer in kilojoules per mole. So negative 
All right, we have one question left here, and this is one of the Hess's Law problems. So remember, for these types of problems, they'll tell you what you're basically aiming for. So I need to make my equation look like this, and I can do a couple of different types of tricks to do that. Sometimes you just add them up directly. Uh, sometimes you need to flip something in order to make it work. Uh, sometimes you might have to double or halve either one of the two equations or possibly double or halve your answer in the end. Uh, now, I don't really have a lot of room to write up here since I took a screenshot. So I'm going to rewrite these equations just to give myself a little extra room. And then I will start solving from there. Okay, so now I have my two equations, I know what I'm looking for. What I typically start off doing is just going from left to right and then see if things are already in the spots they're supposed to be. So for example, I see that I'm supposed to have aluminum on the left side of my equation. All right, aluminum is on the left side of this equation, so that one's okay. I'm supposed to have iron three oxide on the left side of this equation. It's currently on the right, uh, right side of this equation. So that means that this one has to get flipped. So I'm going to flip this equation. I'm going to change my sign of delta H. And I'm going to cross out this equation because it will no longer be used. So I'm going to write Fe2O3 solid. I'm going to try to keep my arrow lined up because it makes it easier to see what's on the left and right side. So you can look back and forth quickly. I have uh, two irons plus three halves of an oxygen. And delta H is now a positive 821. So because I did a flip here, I just flipped my sign. This equation is no longer valid. It's been replaced. Al2O3 is supposed to be on the right side. It already is. doesn't look like I have to make any other changes. So now we're going to sum everything up and see if I got exactly what I was supposed to get. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. So let's see what happens. I have three halves oxygen on the left and three halves on the right. So those are going to cancel out completely. Remember, they don't have to cancel out completely. Maybe I have a four on one side, a two on the other. In that case, it would be like subtraction. Looking around, I'm not seeing anything else that's going to cancel. It looks like everything else is just going to pull through. So I have two aluminum solid plus Fe2O3 solid makes two Fe solid plus Al2O3 solid. And when I add up my two new delta H values, I get negative 780 kilojoules. And that is the correct answer. But I do want to talk about some other things here. You may notice that up here, I have the iron written uh, first and then the aluminum, the aluminum oxide. It is written exactly the same, uh, the same way down here. But I could easily flip-flop these two things that it would mean the same exact thing. So remember, that's like writing 1 plus 2 or 2 plus 1. So they both equal 3. So as long as they're on the same side of the arrow, that's okay. It's still uh, equivalent to itself. All right, so that covers uh, the major topics that are going to be on your quiz. Uh, some other things I wanted to mention about your quiz, I've, I've said a few times it's only 14 questions, so it is going to be considerably shorter than this. Uh, Calculation-wise, there's uh, one or two of each of the major types of calculations. So you have your specific heat problems, you have uh, calorimetry, Hess's law, and then you also have the uh, stoichiometry types of problems. For those, you want to make sure that you write out your work as much as possible because I will be giving partial credit. But make sure that as you're preparing tonight, you don't just look at the calculations. Seven of those 14 questions are concept-based. And it's a lot harder to get partial credit for a lot of those. Some are multiple choice, uh, some are short answer, but you're either right or wrong with it. So make sure that you are looking over your notes. I tried to give you an idea of the types of concept questions I might ask within here. So uh, hopefully that helped. Uh, I will definitely be available tomorrow morning for extra help. 
So if you want, come to 300. If you don't see me there, find me in the science office. Uh, and there should also be tutoring in the library today after school. So you can check in there. It should be either uh, Mr. McInerney or Mrs. Rockle.